Welcome to today's episode for people interested in the extraordinary, yet ancient and often long forgotten stuff. This is your host, Joseph Schinwald from ownbythebeach.com. And our guest today is Carolyn Feather Gold. Hello, Carolyn. Hi, Joseph. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. It's so wonderful to have you on the show today. And um, the topic is the many dimensions of color, light, form, texture, and their effects on us. So Carolyn Feathergold is interior designer and author. And uh, I would like to talk with you right away from the beginning. I would like to know more about you and your profession that will lead later on to uh, some interesting concepts, some uh, theories you developed and At, towards the end of the interview, we will also talk about the Liberty 2041 Hexa Series, your book. So let's start. Tell us about yourself, uh, Caroline. Wonderful. Um, certainly, I have been an interior designer, I would say, since I was five. I considered myself an interior designer. Um, my mother had a a gift for it and she had a lot of magazines and I would look through the pictures and I would critique the pictures in the design magazines and decided what what I liked and what I didn't like. And that led to art school and eventually design school. And the, the majority of my career has been in interior design, which is not only my profession, but my calling. And, um, Probably around 2008, I discovered that interior design was more than beauty and function, but it was a way to help people feel better, function better in their lives. And um, I was invited to be part of a program that helped children that had learning differences and how their classroom affected their behavior and how they processed information and one thing led to another and I realized that I had discovered something that didn't had never been discussed before and so I turned my what I call my classically trained interior design techniques and they evolved into something very deep and interesting um, in addition, I discovered that I had a neurological gift called synesthesia, which is the, it's like a phenomenon in a lot of creative people where you have, you're stimulated with one thing and there's something else happens. For example, I might taste colors or see shapes when I hear music and um, I can't drive and listen to music because there's, I can see what's going on. I can see the costumes and the opera and things. So that all sounds very interesting, but you wonder how does that relate to interior design? Well, there's a, a term called sense, um, sensory overload. Um, I like to call it visual noise. So when you're in a space, There are a lot of elements you may not be aware of that are making noise in your head. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a messy room or anything. They're just elements that for you in particular would affect how you could process information from sleeping to working, learning, so forth. So my theories and techniques evolved and um, I'm able to help people live better lives based on what's in their room. And this is all based on science. Well, wow. how, how important is empty space when you design rooms? I mean, we, are, we know the topic uh, is the many dimensions of color, light, form, texture, and their effect on us. And yet, we also know that uh, all of this actually happens in this emptiness. So we use emptiness, right, for all this to come about. When I enter a space, someone's home, someone's small office, a small business, whatever it might be, I, I, I can immediately sense what's off. And 
I have a very grand picture in my mind of how it can be. And then I have to backtrack and create this. It's almost like a feeling of what it will be more than how it looks, but how it needs to feel. And so I imagine a space like an empty box and I can see it empty even if it's full. And so if you imagine just a white box and you just take everything out and slowly layer elements in and you only put in what's healthy and what you need versus things that might not be uh, good for you, just like a, a diet. And so you just start with the basic surfaces and the flooring and the walls, but before any of that, light is the most important thing. So everything we know from um, ancient scripture will say that before anything else, there was light. Without the proper light, your brain won't function properly. So before you put in colors and shapes and furniture and all of this, you have to get the light right. And so the ideal color is natural light, the color of natural light, sorry. Um, so there are now bulbs that produce the equivalent to sunlight. You can be in a room with no windows and feel that you're in a sunlit room. And that gives the brain the proper information to process everything that they're that that you're seeing is processed correctly um it's very interesting and i i came to it because i experienced it myself i was at the smithsonian museum in dc many years ago in a museum that's underground and i kept looking for windows which couldn't possibly be because it was at the level of the subway which is pretty far down and it was these light bulbs were only used in commercial situations and it took many years for them to make it to the residential environment, but now they're used and it's wonderful. So you don't have to have windows. If you're unfortunate enough not to have natural light, there are many ways to get you to that point. Um, there's also a condition that's been abbreviated. The acronym is SAD, it's seasonal seasonal affective disorder and it happens a lot in in um, european countries northern like scandinavian countries where there's light for many months but then it's dark for many months and people become very depressed so there's a company that originally developed almost it looks like a baseball cap and the visor part has a light and they call it a happy light and so people can walk around with the proper lighting and so they're not affected by the, the lack of natural light. So we have to keep in mind how important being outside, even if it's for a little bit of time, um, how that affects our well being, our brain, and how we process information. Yes, um, I was uh, thinking right now when, you, when I listened to you, uh, how living environment surely reflects our consciousness, our feelings. Uh, you say our brain, of course. Well, we we go, we'll get to this later about your book, where notions like space, you know, and uh, there is uh, there are many elements in there which actually reflect what you just said. Uh, I believe that you know what you said. You go to the basics. You go to the empty space, and you go to the light first, to the natural light, and even you mentioned scripture. That's how everything started. The whole universe, exactly. right? If it ever if it ever started, <laughs> we don't know. Nobody knows, right? How long it is already, whatever. But um, interesting, very interesting. So, more tell us a little bit more about your profession. I, I looked at your website, and you have wonderful customer testimonials. So you bring you bring something to your clients, which is is essentially it has to do with their minds. While you do the interior this interior design, you're working actually on their happiness on on better feelings on better results for their daily life a better sleep for the children and uh, all, all, all with the harmony of the inside and the outside the inside of the mind with the outside of of, of interior design or design in general oh, exactly and thank you for saying that because the term interior design for me is a play on words it's really your interior 
and how your interior is affected by the so-called interior design of whatever space you're in. So meaning, again, the elements around you affect how you feel inside and how you process everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, my, my process starts with a sensory assessment of my clients, and I don't think any interior designer that I know of does anything quite like this. So uh, the clients enjoy it, and then they say, why are you asking me this? And maybe six, down, six months down the road when their project is complete, I'll say, remember when I asked you what your favorite scents were? this is why and i might point at an element and it'll it'll make sense or sometimes people will tell me they don't care for a certain color and i'm sitting across from them and that color that they say they don't care for is right behind them on a lamp and i wonder how <laughs> is that possible so it might be that that lamp was given to them by someone they love or it was a kind gesture and they've blocked out the color because they've there's an emotional attachment to the object but that if that's a color that you mention you don't like it's it has an adverse reaction for you and so how do you handle that do you cover it up do you paint it <laughs> do you put it in another room possibly so so there's just i i'm very observant. I'm a very visual person. And so I catch nuances that people don't. So once we start working together, like one wonderful client, we were in her kitchen, we were remodeling her kitchen, and she pointed at a cabinet and she said, why is that cabinet bothering me? I don't know what it is, but what's bothering me about it? So I'm like a translator. So I explained that the grain of the wood, it, they were unpainted still. So they the type of wood they used was important, but not the grain of the wood. And the grain was going in all different directions, which didn't matter for the final result, but she was seeing it unfinished, raw, and that bothered her. She was that sensitive, but she didn't know what it was that was bothering her. So I find that fascinating. <laughs> and it just, I speak another language, let's say. I speak a sensory language, and I pick up on these very subtle things that I can then explain to people once the cabinet got painted that wasn't an issue anymore but at the time it was she thought there was something wrong with her cabinet yeah I, I can only imagine how how it affects us the way we have uh, the way we use light and different dimensions of color which goes all back to light really I think uh, the neutral color is the light right and then from there with the spectrum we get all of the different colors right and then we have the form, and and all all we live in, in this whole universe is is something we say metaphysical came into existence, and now we have form, right? right? But the form, people, uh, you give you give it meaning. It's not just the form; it is a certain expression of energy, and um, then texture, as you just explained. And how does it affect us? Well, it is just our surrounding and uh, the inside reflects the outside and the outside reflects the inside it's like one implies the other you don't have one without the other and uh, of course you know i can imagine if you are not very much aware of it you might certain emotional responses to this and you don't even know exactly. it. if you have something wrong if you have the wrong colors in your in your room let's say where you want to uh study you know or, or another room where you want to sleep or it all is the inside implies the outside and the outside the inside right? exactly there's i i'm sorry to say i don't know the name of the test or the equipment but um there is a way of testing color and it emits shapes let's say equivalent to an ekg when it's attached to someone's heart color has its own frequency and there's some colors that are more gentle and some colors are, I'll call them spikier. So, um, for example, they did an experiment and they put a, a very happy, comfortable, placid baby in a yellow room and the baby started crying because yellow, though people are very drawn to yellow, 
for an interesting reason, which I'll explain in a moment, the baby picked up on the vibration of the color. The baby doesn't know it's yellow. The baby's just responding to its environment. Or like when the mom is upset, the baby knows and it gets upset at the same time. So I, I was intrigued by yellow because I'm affected by yellow, not in a positive way. <laughs> and um, I saw there was a trend in the city that I lived that a lot of people were painting their rooms yellow. And I thought, why are they doing this to themselves? So I started asking, oh, tell me, why do you like yellow rooms? And they said, oh, because it makes me think of sunshine. It makes me feel good. Well, if you really look outside on a sunny day, which we have here today, the sky is blue. It may not really be blue, and I don't quite understand the science of that, but we'll go with the sky is blue on a pretty day. And the sun appears to be yellow, and people are equate the color yellow with the happiness, but it's not really the color of the yellow sun. It's the color of the light that's emitted on a sunny day. So they may think the room is making them feel good, but I sometimes, if the opportunity is there, I will share with them that in fact, that color is not making them feel good, but we could tone it down or change a few things. But it's interesting, the preconceived notions people have of color based on what they think that it is, but versus what it really is and how it affects them. So not to say that loving yellow is a bad thing by any means, because if I did a test on one person, like what colors they like, if that color gives them joy, I want them to feel joy and I want them to have it. But just like spices, I equate certain colors with cooking. I'm not a cook with food, but I cook with colors and shapes is what I tell people. And so there are certain colors like red, orange, and yellow that should be used like spice very sparingly a little bit goes a long way so definitely get your fix of the spiciest spice you like but if you put too much then you don't taste the food meaning you don't enjoy the benefits of the room that you're in for whatever purpose so some colors are more conducive in some rooms for certain activities and not for others so reds and oranges are associated with food so they're good for like intimate dining areas or things like that. But I wouldn't put someone in a red bedroom or an orange bedroom because they would never sleep. <laughs> and yellow, <laughs> definitely not. What would be nice in a bedroom? Pardon? Like blue? Blue, yes. What would be a good blue color? Tones. Yeah. How about yeah. green? Blues, greens. The greens would have to be more in the bluer family than the yellower family, but Is, are referred to as cool colors, violets, blues, greens, uh, definitely very soothing because there we associate those with sky, water, grass. All of those things are very pleasurable. And when we talk about the form, what is your favorite form? Mine is, mine is the circle, mine ah. is uh, everything round, everything yeah. round. Round is yeah. very soothing. Anything with circles, curves, spirals, uh, rounded corners on walls, artwork that's more circular, um, things with angles or straight lines are more agitating. So there are people that find comfort in very sparse, we'll say like Scandinavian environments, let's say they're very simple, lovely clean smooth lines but if everything is linear it's very harsh so you want to add a few you know maybe natural elements a piece of wood or an artwork with more curvature to it it just gives your brain a rest from all the straight lines whereas the brain does not tire from circular or spiral shapes i see and texture What is texture, your favorite texture? Um, some people are very drawn to soft, silky fabrics. You can see the way they dress, the, the type of material they wear for their clothing, the type of material they might be attracted for their furniture. It's, it's comforting. 
things with texture give things give um, a space interest and dimension, but it we might not use it for a surface that you touch. You might just enjoy looking at it. We don't necessarily have to touch it. Um, so there's a interesting test based on if you're testing for someone to see if they have synesthesia. It's called Puba and Kiki. So there are two shapes. One of them is very, it looks like a cotton ball, let's say it's just fluffy and round. And the other one is spiky. And you ask the person, which one would you name Kiki and which one would you name Booba? And people that have more awareness of things or people that don't even know that they have it, most likely will say that Kiki is the spiky shape, just the sound of the K-I-K-I -I versus the Booba, which is a B-U sound. It's fascinating. So it doesn't matter if you're aware of it or not, your instinct connects the shape with the sound of the letters. Well, I, I can imagine because uh, ultimately, you know, this uh, this podcast is called Om by the Beach. And as you said, scripture says everything was light in the beginning, right? And uh, But also in, in the Orient, in the East, like in India, it's uh, a lot like from the sound of mm -hmm. Om that everything, you know, and we have in with the sound of ohm, sound frequency can uh, affect phenomena uh, and create forms and textures. Uh, like uh, it has an effect, like an effect on plasma, right? So it, it creates, the sound creates. So I think it's absolutely interconnected light and sound. And uh, that's why we have to be aware of it when we are creating our environment Absolutely. or what kind of environment we have. Right? So uh, ohm and light, probably that's where the origin of the lights, right? Because from ohm, from ohm come, come all the sounds, all the music, all, all the sounds, like all the birds singing and we talking, it all comes mm -hmm. from ohm. And then with, with the light, that's where all the colors come from. And it's all basically frequencies. And we are energy as beings and uh, we are not always aware of it but we are that is what we have to uh, see as a relationship of uh, internal and, uh, and external and that goes Absolutely. together it affects each other it affects the inside affects the outside the outside the inside and that's the balance of life in a sense right absolutely i mean we've all um well we've all a lot of people that are probably interested in, in what you talk about, things that are outside of the norm or things that are metaphysical, have seen studies of when you um, have different jars with water and you, you have positive thoughts or positive words towards the water and then they look at the molecular structure under a microscope and see the shape of the water changes based on what it heard. And so if we're mostly yes. water, how do, who knows what we look like inside when people are being spoken to nicely and hear music that's soothing and in environments that make them calm versus having a spiky life and spiky surroundings. Not everybody has the ability to change everything, but if you know it, you can compensate for it. If you can't change it, you can step outside go walk in a park or yes. even look at a book or it's just something to to let your brain receive that information. No, that, that's all I wanted to say was just the influence of just words and sounds, like you were saying, vibration. If sound affects, the sound of someone's voice affects molecular structures in water, the, the sound, again, the visual noise that a space creates in our mind and therefore in our body has to be related. So uh, one of my techniques is called spa my space. So let's say that I, I treat the room to a deep cleansing <laughs> and um, then the room feels better. I'm treating the room and then the person that occupies the room or the dweller of the space is going to benefit that the space feels better to them. And so it's 
it's a back and forth and it doesn't when you go to a spa you get these wonderful facials and massages by the next day it's all going to evaporate the facial will be gone the massage will be gone you'll remember it but you won't have the sensation but if you treat your room in a certain way that's not going to wear off if you maintain it it's going to be therapeutic day in and day out well wow, it's so interesting yes Yes, and so important. I think we lack awareness of it. We lack, we are not conscious of it. We think uh, that it is often not important, maybe. And, uh, and it is. It affects us every day because we are every day in this uh, surroundings which we create around us. Exactly. So, uh, Caroline, the one thing I really want you to, uh, I would like to know uh, and it would be so interesting for the audiences, you developed certain theories. And um, that reflects then in the book you have uh, created with your husband, Robert. And Robert uh, Gold will be also on a show in a, in a few weeks, probably, right? And um, so that is, you're working very much in, in harmony with your husband. And tell us a little bit about how you met and how you realized that... Uh, you're both introvert, empath, empathetic. And, and would you explain a little bit more? Because you have a theory behind it. And that theory of uh, HSP, I don't know mm -hmm. what that is. But you have you have mentioned it uh, as a term in your theory. Introvert, empath, and how they are relevant. And they become very uh, strong in your book also, which we want to talk a little bit uh, about. Yes, thank you. Which is, yeah. Those are great questions. So, um I think throughout the years, as the term introvert and extrovert have been used, people have misinterpreted it with being um, outgoing and shy. And that can play a part of it, but the true meaning of introvert and extrovert means how you recharge your inner battery. So an introvert like myself enjoys being with people but after a while, I will feel physically exhausted and I will have to retrieve. And maybe the next day I, I may not go anywhere because I mean, this last year I've more than recharged my battery by being at home. <laughs> I'm ready to go yes. out. But, um, and an extrovert recharges their battery by being with people so they they go they get um they feel better when they're constantly charging their battery with people they don't need to be off i mean they need to be off a little bit but not as much as an introvert does so there are people that are very outgoing personalities that consider themselves introverts because they do need time off they have to put themselves in time out, let's say, to recharge, to, to, I'll call it, perform again later or tomorrow. So, um, so I'm definitely an introvert. And um, the term empath is someone that not only feels for someone else, but we feel what the other person is feeling. So if, Joseph, you told me today that you have a little bit of a sore throat and you feel maybe you have a cold coming on. In about a half hour, I will start having those sensations, not because I have it, but I feel for you and I feel what you feel. So, and if you're being a compassionate person, that's a beautiful thing, but the type of um, what I'm describing is tied to my synesthesia. So I hear what you have and I feel it. So if you're in pain, I might feel that pain and it's exhausting. It's not that I don't want it. I think it's a gift and it comes in handy. And that's why I do what I do for people. Cause I, I know how they feel and I want to make them feel better, but I can't be around a lot of, information because and it took me years to understand that and figure it out and so now i'm very careful i'm i will still listen and everything but after a while i'll have to say 
to myself, you know, I need to remove myself or, or I can't see things on TV or in a movie because I can feel it. So um, that's the empath. So you feel for others. And the term HSP stands for highly sensitive person. And it's kind of a combination of what I've shared. Um, an HSP also may sense what's going on in the room, but they may not understand that it's that lamp behind them, to use the earlier example. Um, but they may experiment, they may have enough awareness or they have tremendous awareness and go, I could never have that lamp in my room. There's just no way that would work for me. So there are different levels and we're all learning as we go. I learn things every day of things that agitate me or it's things that soothe me. And so then I try to share them with other people or work them into a project or something. In the, in the last few years, I was imagining that I wanted to meet a very nice man who would be sitting in his home quietly watching films or reading books or something, somebody that didn't need to be out and about. And how in the world was I going to meet this person if we were both being introverts? And I decided to um, try one more time. I'd been married many years ago. And um, this time I knew exactly what I was looking for and what I was willing to put up with and not put up with. And um, I saw somebody on a dating site and his tagline was gentle soul 52. Not the typical name for a man on a dating site. And so uh, I was intrigued by what he said and what he wrote was so similar to what I had written. So we, we met and it turned out we had a lot of people that we knew in common and we lived a mile from each other for many, many years. Maybe we saw each other, maybe we didn't, who knows, but um, that's how I met my husband. And so we got married in late 2018. So we're still in the newly married phase and he is has a very complex brain. I thought I was a complicated person, so is he, and more so. And he wrote a, a, the manuscript for a very interesting storyline called Liberty 2041. And it was a very long story, but the premise was very interesting. And it was teenagers who went to repair the world in the year 2041. And the protagonist is a 14 year old girl and all the other characters are just little pieces of my husband's brain different personalities which is very interesting one is called joseph one is called joseph exactly and he's <laughs> very intelligent and is a very good listener and a very loyal friend so I think you, you shared those qualities with Joseph. So we knew you were going to be in the book before we knew you, which is great. Amazing. <laughs> so in a parallel world, as my profession evolved and all these theories came about, I really wanted to create a book, but I had no idea how to convey in book form the ideas that I had and the concepts and the images, there was just the technology maybe would be there, maybe not. I don't even know until I read Robert's manuscript. And that uh, led to be able to combine both our professions and create this interesting book. So Robert developed um, a type of technology it, I mean, he's written about it. It's, he's hoping that he will meet some bodies that um, will help him produce this. And it's his concept of what would happen after the internet. So it's a much more intuitive form of technology where it really, it services you, not all the corporations like it does now. And um, it, interestingly enough, he had never heard about synesthesia he thought he had come up with a concept of synesthesia through his technology and how these kids were affected 
by colors and sensations through their um, devices, let's say. So the protagonist has a very fiery personality and she gets prompted by her technology to let her know you're about to get really upset. So you better <laughs> bring it back in and or she'll feel tingles or something, something will happen in the back of her knee to let her know certain things and they get to program their technology. And they're not allowed to share that information with anybody else because it could be used against them. Um, all the passwords have become obliterated because that didn't work. And so what they're down to in 2041 is their senses and that's how their technology works. So it connects their emotions to how the technology prompts them to feel or respond and so forth. And the premise is that the, the world chancellor, which is the, the villain in the story, the villain. is threatening yeah. to remove the ability for these kids to function by using their technology and that's all they know. So they're panicked as how they're going to survive in a world where they they have to rely on themselves. They don't know what that's like. So that allowed Robert and my ideas to merge beautifully. And so we rewrote, we kept the same storyline, but we rewrote the book. And instead of one very long manuscript, it's now become a six part series. The first episode is out and the second one is about to be released in the next couple of weeks. Yes, so excited. I read the first episodes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's our baby, our late in life baby. So we're planning to have six babies. <laughs> we foresee that will happen. Yes, I'm, I'm looking forward when the next one is out. I think it should be in a few days now. Yes, um, it's on pre-sale now and it's um, it'll be released um, April 27th, actually. So that's the second episode. It's, the whole series is called Liberty 2041, and each book has either four or five short stories in them. And they also come in yes. short reads now. So you can just get one story at a time as an ebook, and then mm -hmm. just get them mm -hmm. as you finish them, or you can get the whole first book. And every one as it comes out will come out in the short short read version for people that like bite-sized adventures well we would have still time a little bit to, if you uh, if i could ask you the main the main storyline you mentioned it uh -huh. already you mentioned the villain the yes. chancellor and you mentioned the protagonist but um, what is the main story line if you could still mention it my my take when you speak to robert he may have a different take which makes it I'm sure it'll be very interesting. Um, I think it's the the way the book has evolved. It's it's a coming of age book where kids start um, discovering who they are. As they're, it starts when she's twelve, and right now it takes us to the present where she's fourteen, and it's just becoming aware of yourself and becoming aware of others, learning how to be compassionate, patient, understanding, which our protagonist is none of the above. <laughs> and also seeing your parents as people and realizing that they were your age at one point and who they were and who they've become. And lately I've been thinking the book could also be about our inner child. If I didn't tell you how old the characters were in the storyline, they could be any age. Their behaviors are, you know, some people that are adults behave in a more immature way, and some young people are extremely mature. So the age isn't really relevant, but it, it's how the story was written, and it's important because the... Jessica Stafford, who's a protagonist, her most passionate interest is fighting for the vote for 14-year-olds in the next presidential election. 
which would be whatever year after 2041 will be. And that's, that's how she becomes famous. But she didn't do it to be famous. She just felt very strongly that kids her age were smart enough and had enough awareness that they could have um, an influence on the elections because those elections affect them. And so then by doing all of this, she gains the attention of the, her nemesis, the arch villain, the world chancellor, who will become a very interesting character. And I look forward to writing more about him. He doesn't even have a name because he likes calling himself the world chancellor, capital T-H-E. So his name is not relevant, but he's an interesting character and to write an interesting antagonist, you have to create a character that you feel compassion for also. So that's an interesting process to write things about someone that you, it, you don't want the readers to like, but then there'll be something about him that you'll have to like about him or understand why he became the way he became. So I look forward to that challenge. I already have the general idea of what it's going to be, but, um, and the rest of the story, just the Jessica's friends and they're all very different personalities, very different backgrounds. We talk about adoption, we talk about divorce, we talk about learning differences. Um, really, I've started making a list of all the subjects we're discussing. There are just so many layers to it that I discover them as I review it. And everybody can find something to relate to. Um, and uh, the process is fascinating. It's another way of being creative for me. Now I'm designing with words. I can only use words. I don't have props. I don't have tile. I don't have paint samples. Though I will be creating sample boards for people to see online of what certain characters' rooms looks like because I can't write about them without creating them. So I do have actual things <laughs> to go by. And that's fun because it makes it more realistic. Wow, that's uh, yeah. It's it's very different. I mean, I have been reading the book, and I I like the word chancellor also. You know, my story. I've been I'm Austrian, right? Again, back in Austria, and I have been like 13 years with a hemisphere newspaper in South America. So I got to know those world chancellors <laughs> in the different countries. Right. right? right. <laughs> so yeah, very very good in manipulating, and you know. Uh, keeping the people at a certain ignorance level and, uh, you know, just, I, I thought about it, you know, and, and, you know, you don't have to hate, just as you said, you don't have to hate those people. In fact, uh, they are as necessary in the world as when you look at a real good movie, a real good movie, and there is no villain, then you will not watch it. I mean, after if the villain doesn't come after 10 right. minutes and something interesting happens, it's just, and our life is very much similar. I think what we have to learn in our life is do not identify with these polarizations because the polarizations, they're just natural, but when they go to the extreme and when people go to the extremes, then it becomes a point of their own suffering, like the Buddhist, the Buddhist doctrine is, right? Suffering. Right is when you don't when you don't avoid the extremes there there you have to find the middle way the middle path so uh, very very interesting and i'm looking forward for the next uh, episodes maybe i should just definitely now mention your website where they can find more about your profession as an interior designer but also there is the book there is also a nice press page where people can invite you to talk like you talked on my show today and uh, also, when I looked for your book, it's everywhere. It's a, it's a, you, you have done a fantastic marketing, I think. It's a, you can find it on Goodreads.com, Amazon, of course. But when I looked at Amazon, when I bought it, I saw there are just so many already, and such wonderful and beautiful people. They have read it, and they they gave really fantastic uh, reviews. Could you mention the website 
where people can uh, know, uh, find more information about you, or actually also get in touch with you. Oh, sure. It says the gold. It says the gold Dutch. So I think they can get in yes. touch with you. Excellent. That's <laughs> great, Joseph. Thank you. I hadn't thought about that spin. So, yeah, the the interior design explanation of what I do is on the goldtouch.net, all in lowercase. Um, that explains what I do, what my husband does, and what we do together, independently of being authors. And then we have um, the opportunity to request a consultation and a, a little bit of a sensory assessment for fun to do it. Um, and then our uh, author's website is the same as the book. It's liberty2041.com. And there you have the opportunity to converse with the characters and ask the characters questions wow. or why, why have they done things the way they've done them or what would you suggest that they do in a situation? We want to engage conversation. The book is being read from 12 year olds up to 120. There's, it's a very clean, innocent book. It just deals with emotions and feelings. And we wanted it to be that way without the distraction of what's so available everywhere else. So we feel by contrast, our book is different because it doesn't incorporate what tends to sell, which is bad language and inappropriate thoughts. We know those exist, but that's not what we need to talk about. We need to talk about how to repair ourselves to be able to repair the world. And that's really the gist of the, the story. That, that's where Robert comes in, right? With positive you know, words and, and just what you said, repair the world. And he, he believes a lot in this uh, importance of words and Absolutely. thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah. He's, mm -hmm. he's a great communicator with words and how to um, evolve and transform in your life. He does it with words. I do it with space. And so it actually mm -hmm. took me a year to figure out how to combine our professions. And so the goldtouch.net, our website, is really a year of thinking <laughs> of how to bring two very complex thinkers together and how to make our professions merge to to help people have better lives so we're very proud of what we do and i'm uh, look forward to being able to help people um, see their surroundings in a completely different way and enjoy being in their spaces and being able to sleep better at night and have children <clears throat> enjoy being in their room uh, versus it being a place for punishment. It should be a place of joy. It should be a haven. Eating more calmly, working better, studying better, everything. It's all possible. If, if your space is friendly towards you, then you will, you will respond in kind. Yes. Interestingly enough, it's also that you are now due to the situation we are in worldwide that you also move, make, made a shift. You made a move to virtual uh, oh, consulting yeah. and virtual uh, coaching. So uh, people who really want to get uh, some help with you, they can actually get in touch with you on the gold touch, the gold touch dot net and get themselves uh, help with their uh, interior design absolutely and, thank uh, you and yes it's mm -hmm. done in real time it's not a here's a pdf step by step is we actually do it mm -hmm. together i would like to be there with oh. them but now that it's all virtual i could be anywhere in the world like i am with you right now i'm in the states and you're in austria it's wonderful we are coming to the end of the show of course and i'm really looking forward also to talk with uh, your husband robert gold we have a lot of commonalities, uh, particularly with. We have been just an hour recently talking, right? It wasn't. It wasn't an interview. It was just because 
we have a certain affinity, you and your husband and me, we talked about, uh, you know, philosophical things and it was super interesting. Not only super interesting that moment, but later, the next days, I still had to think about those things. <laughs> it was very super. I really I look forward to it. And when I have the appointment with him and when we can talk here on the show also. So really, uh, thank you, Caroline, for having been on the show. Thank oh, you. Thank you for being so receptive and asking such wonderful questions. I thank also you, uh, Caroline, because it is uh, a great pleasure to learn your the, the richness of your experience of the world. You know, you, you have so such a rich understanding. So thank you. And uh, also thank you to the listeners for joining us today. The recap of the show, as I said, will be in the show notes and also on the website ownbythebeach.com. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to it. So you have, we have you here again for our next episode. This is your host, Joseph Schinwald. Thank you and goodbye until we meet again.